Yeah, I can tell you're not using Quack or whatever that is. <laughs> yeah, let me hey, know how... everybody, let's. Um... Oh, I I've got us loaded somewhere where I can hear us. Oh. All right, there we go. Um, and I'm going to remove the banner. How you doing today, John? Good, good. Had a great uh, time last night at the uh, Startup Drinks Teal, which was super fun. And lots of people showed up. How many, do you know how many we had? Um, we were really close to 100. Awesome. Um, might have been just over. Because sometimes, you know, we don't write everything down as we go. So we'll yeah. look through the numbers. But yeah, and not everybody's in the room at the time. But it was a, a good crowd. Um, yeah. So yeah, everyone said good things about um, the Canadian, Canadian, the uh, CIX, yeah, the Canadian Innovation Exchange, and um, lots of great startups, lots of great investors. Yeah, it was. Uh, I didn't get to go, but I heard it was really good. It was it was a different venue this time because I think before it was at Mars, right? Yeah, historically it's not been there. Yeah. Um, and, but that's fine. I, I haven't tried the design exchange. Um, I hear it's a little bit underground. Ah, interesting. Okay. People said it, it felt like a basement kind of thing. Yeah. So, and that was right across the street from where we were. So it's great. So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're just going to jump in. I do a little yeah. idle banner at the beginning of this. Um, you know what we should do is maybe just a quick update on ai tool or something at the beginning of this just to get people to start from now on because we're always talking about the different tools we're using like i just installed unclack to try and take keyboard noises out of when we're recording live and we'll see if that works see how good it works but here. let's jump into it welcome back to future tech your weekly source for the latest in tech and innovation i'm the startup coach and i'm always i'm joined by my co-host john Irwin. how you doing today john i'm good craig how are you Good, and I just realized you were way over in the corner of my uh, TV that I use as a monitor, so I'm looking way away from the. Uh, I'm right beside you on me, mine, so yeah. And people keep telling me, "Don't like you don't look like you're paying attention." That's because I keep moving the windows around because I got a, yeah. but I am paying attention. It's I don't just get it nowadays. Look, everyone has multiple monitors, so they should be used yeah. to people looking elsewhere, right? I don't. Know. I guess, but I guess yeah. when you're live in the webinar, yeah. people are. Um, but I move the windows around because I got to share the screens. I got to do all the stuff. And that means I'm looking. I, For those people who are joining us, thanks for joining us. But I got a 43-inch uh, TV behind me, uh, that uh, in front of me that I'm using. So I'm going like this. It's uh... Yeah, you do all of the back-end work. I just show up and, and yap. <laughs> well, I just show up and uh, for lack of the... Uh, a better word i'm the straight person here from uh you're the you got all the details i'm the wow. regular person that's gonna ask the questions yeah. i don't know if that's true or not but we'll go with it yeah let's go with it all right let me get rid of this and that and so let's get into the first one here um reverse microwave yeah uh, cool. and it actually works um i think so so uh, for cooling for cooling instead of heating. So, and, and don't think of it like microwave because it's not microwave technology, like what it is in an actual microwave. So the article itself, it discusses, it's, it's an innovative new solid state cooling technology, which was developed by researchers in Luxembourg. Um, and it functions like, and they're calling it a reverse microwave because it's supposed to cool really fast to rapidly cool objects. So what it uses is an electrocaloric effect rather than vapor compression for cooling. So vapor compression is used in, in a whole bunch of different devices right now. It's not. So uh, this is going to be really interesting if if they can uh, commercialize it. So um, what the electrocaloric effect does is it causes certain materials like aluminum to heat up or cool down when an electric field is applied or removed. And so the researchers configured electrocaloric capacitors that alternate between heating and cooling cycles by switching the electric field on and off. Pretty straightforward. Um, the cool thing is the electricity-free system can efficiently pump heat without needing bulky greenhouse-emitting compressors that are required in refrigerators and air conditioners. So 
um, it actually represents a more sustainable and energy efficient cooling method. And this is cool because I was I was doing some <laughs> I went down the rabbit hole about using magnets. Apparently, you can use magnets to cool things. Um, and I think this is it's I, I don't know how similar it is, and I didn't I didn't do a deep dive into the comparison. But um, the cool thing about the magnet thing is that. Again, it uses it doesn't use greenhouse gases. It doesn't uh, use too much electricity. So this is really interesting. And so the way they did this is they pair the capacitors with liquid coolant to enable the rapid heat transfer. And and then when a, an electric field is applied, the coolant heats up, which cools the system uh, through the electrocaloric effect. And then reversing that process releases the heat buildup. So. They envision applications in kitchens to quickly cool foods, consumer appliances, electronics cooling, industrial uses like semiconductor manufacturing where heat management is critical. Um, and so, yeah, it's really cool. Um, it's promising, but more research is needed to optimize the materials and configurations for commercialization. But it does demonstrate how new physics breakthroughs can disrupt entrenched engineering paradigms, which is awesome because everything that we most of the things that we're using to date for cooling are just horrible for the environment not efficient like just not sustainable at all so when i think the concept of a reverse microwave are we talking about like cooling a plate of food or are we talking about a freezer um uh that's a good question i, I i'm i'm thinking it's it, i think you can you're going to be able to control it. So I'm thinking here, based on the technology here, if they can get it to a place, it's going to be either like rapid freezing or cooling uh, to a point. So you put a beer in there and it'll cool within seconds kind of thing. Or you want to freeze something, flash freeze something, you could probably use that too. If they get the technology, there. I don't think it's there yet. Um, I think it's it, it's obviously still in in more of the concept fees um but i think once once they prove it and commercialize it um it'll be it won't be like a microwave where um it's got this it the way a microwave works is it it if you're heating something up it turns on and off as you're heating it up right so um or it stays on or or depending on the power strength um where this is uh, I feel like it's more of a blast of air, but I could be wrong. We'll 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 have to see um, what they uh, what they end up with. Yeah, it. Um, I'm looking at this, and it looks very interesting. But there, I didn't have any links to follow up with this yeah. one, just to go down the rabbit hole like you had did. Um, it looks very interesting. It's electrical electricity free, and you kind of explained how it works. Um, but yeah. it, you're talking about a vapor. There's well, gotta no, be... so... go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Let's dive into that. So, uh, yeah, and it's it's let's get into the details of that. So, what? And it's called the electrocaloric effect. So what it does is it causes certain materials like aluminum to heat up or cool down. So different types of materials that they're going to have to um, that they're going to have to experiment with. But the way it happens is it's due to the interactions between the electric fields and the electric dipoles or ferroelectric behavior in the material itself. So in a system like this, they use a capacitor which is made of uh, an electrocaloric material like aluminum as one plate. And then when an electric field is applied, the material heats up as its temperature increases. Now, on the other side of the capacitor is a liquid coolant. So as the material heats up, heat is transferred to the coolant, causing the coolant to get hotter while the material cools down. So by alternating the electric field on and off, the heat gets pumped from one side to the other in a cyclic kind of process. And then the hot coolant then passes through a heat exchanger to dissipate the heat. That's how this, it achieves kind of like a solid state cooling with no need for refrigerants or compressors like vapor compression systems. It's more efficient. There's less energy wasted. It's just the resistance losses in the material. So 
Vapor compression systems, they lose energy through compressor work, um, pressure drops, and phase change losses. So they have um, having fewer moving parts in this and the direct electrocaloric heat pump, it hugely reduces systemic uh, energy losses, if that makes sense. Absolutely does. Just the question becomes is how energy efficient is this? It says it takes no electricity, but it sounds like eventually the system needs to be refueled with something. Yeah. So if we're comparing it to traditional vapor systems, so a few things, there's fewer components and moving parts, as I just mentioned. Um, there's no refrigerant phase changes. So avoiding liquid vapor refrigerant transitions, it improves uh, efficiency. Um, there's less temperature difference. So there's solid state heat pumping um, that works with smaller temperature gradients. Um, there's better heat transfer and there's less pressure drop. So overall, uh, based on what I was reading, um, this new design is estimated to achieve two to five times better energy efficiency compared to the vapor compression refrigerator. So I know that in the article they said elect, um, uh, what did they say? Electric free or something? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's the case. Um, I, if we're looking to commercialize this, obviously, because you're applying an electric field to this, right? So I don't know where they're coming from with that. Yeah, because here, you know, right at the end, it says, you know, uh, the reverse microwave is something we've been asking for for years, but this one also works without electricity and is 100% sustainable. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think that maybe they got GPT to write that <laughs> because it doesn't align with with the physics and everything that they're that they're talking about in the article itself. Yeah, so the so there's some questions here um, about this. It's interesting from um, as the world goes to a more sustainable place and they talk about uh, global warming um, and whether we're actually headed in that direction or it's cyclical, we're heading into a warm cycle or a cool cycle because it's, you know, more, and we're more extremes as the world, uh, as we transfer, because back in the 70s, it was global cooling. Yeah. Nonetheless, this kind of stuff could potentially re reduce our electrical capacity, um, keep things, you know, uh, cool in a uh, hot environment, we could really, I could see this applying in many, many ways. Do you see this kind of thing moving out of, say, the kitchen? Yes, absolutely. So there's, and so let's just start off with food and bev. So you could rapidly cool foods, you can accelerate food processing and chilling beverages, which we talked about. So medicine, by cooling medical devices, um, you have controlled, like really good controlled temperature storage for drugs and vaccines. And I'm sure it's going to be a much smaller uh, device than what you would need currently. Um, so lab equipment cooling. So then we got electronics cooling smartphones. So this, if they can minimize this enough, uh, potentially could cool smartphones, computers, high power laser diodes, so we can have more powerful lasers. Um, automotive. We could put this in. This could be our new air conditioning, right? Uh, cooling seats, steering wheels, thermal management of batteries and power electronics, which would be good for EVs if they still continue to take off. <laughs> um, with aerospace, you could have lighter and more reliable cooling for avionics compared to vapor compression, which is what they use currently. Um, the cool thing is you, I'm, I'm guessing based on what I'm reading is you can have a more precision temperature control. So this would be good for chemical and pharma when you need precision temperature control for chemical reactions, bioreactors, drug synthesis, um, and then residential, air conditioning, refrigeration. Um, so many things. Um, data centers, that would be a huge impact for data centers. So lots of, uh, lots of potential use cases. Definitely. So the question is, when I see this picture at the top, and I think about microwave oven. I don't think about putting one of these on the wall to cool my house because I feel like I'm going to be fried. <laughs> so, you know, is it safe for, you know, yes. people? So the thing is, and, and that's the problem with using, again, uh, with using the word microwave is it's not using microwaves, right? 
Um, I guess they just use that word to kind of get people to understand or get people to put it into a, a, an idea that they can understand. But it, this is safe. You're using electric, uh, you're using electricity and you're using capacitors, um, which is in every, every device that you have. You have capacitors in every device. You have uh, capacitors all over the place. Um, and uh, if you think about it like this, you have an air conditioner most likely in your car. Uh, there's no protection around that. You have an air conditioner outside. There's no protection around that other than the metal encasing it. Um, there, the thing is, the biggest difference is this doesn't use any uh, frequencies, any radio frequencies, like how microwaves do. That's the biggest difference. Yeah, and I just wanted to make that clear because it looked yeah. like they didn't do any of that in the article. But then you see this picture of the person in the clean room and you wonder, well... Well, that could be a picture because, well, losing my voice from last night, too much talking, more talking today. But um, that could be him cooling a um, uh, a microchip or some sort of um, some sort of uh, circuit board in a clean room is what it could be. But who knows? Yeah, I, you know, it just could be B footage from a person in a clean room have nothing to do with what we're talking or about. a generated GPG image. <laughs> yeah, so. So we always have to keep all of those things in mind. I love this idea because, you know, next to free cooling, because it's supposed yeah. to be uh, no electricity. We'll have to see how that works. Yeah. Uh, this looks great. The question now becomes, yeah, uh, how big? Like you talk about sticking something like this in air conditioning your car. Is yeah. it small? Is it big? Is it? I'm guessing it is because there's way less parts that are needed for this um, in order to, to create an efficient cooling uh, cycle system kind of thing. So um, I think right now in air conditioners, you have the compressor, you have the gas, you have a whole bunch of different parts um, that are in a car that are in your air conditioner uh, outside. Um, the cooling coil, which I always... You, people know like the cooling coil that always or doesn't always need to get replaced but that's a part that you see replaced in movies and things like that um it's going to be much smaller now what does it look like now how big is it now who knows but we all know that when you're developing new technology new prototypes are always much bigger than what they uh, most of the time end up being at the end of the day so um, I'm going to be interested to see where they go with this, how long it takes to to get to a, a prototype and then to commercialize it and see how big that size is for sure. And are they going to have to use a different measurement for cooling? Like when we go and look at air conditioners, they talk about BTUs and stuff. So you get an idea of uh, the size of room, something cools down. Uh, but is that the same? Are we going to have the same efficiencies in one of these would it and be measured by btus or would it be something else who knows um so i the, when i was reading this there was something called the car not limit that i was reading about uh maybe they start looking at that it's 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 also known as the car not efficiency uh it refers to the maximum possible efficiency that any heat engine can achieve when operating between two specific temperature reservoirs um, so who knows, maybe they start using that as a, um, as a measurement on top of BTUs. Um, I, I'm guessing because they, 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 they referenced it in this article, I'm guessing they'll start, it, it, it'll have some sort of relevance, um, as they develop. All right. I got two final questions for you, unless the audience wants to ask us something, um, timing and cost, when are we going to see it and how expensive is it going to be? No clue. Um, like you said, like we, I couldn't find too much more uh, uh, about this, but based, so here it is, based on my expertise that I know of materials and, and the types of uh, the design that they're doing and things, it doesn't seem like it's too far off because they're using essentially known technologies. Like they're using uh, a capacitor design. They're using aluminum. They're using um like they're using parts and concepts that have already been proven just putting kind of putting them together and, and designing them um into this 
uh, into this new kind of design kind of thing. So I don't think I know we always use we always use the five to ten year thing. Um, as far as cost goes, no clue. Um, but I'm guessing if they're talking about um, this being implemented into the houses, into houses, into uh, um, into cars and things like that, it's got to be either the same or cheaper than current systems, right? So I know that's not a good answer, but yeah. Yeah, I obviously um it cheaper, more efficient. I I don't know if it if it has to be cheaper but more energy efficient because you know yeah. it, we're living yeah. in a brand new world where people will spend a lot more if you know yeah. my electricity bill is dropped by this technology. For sure. But like it it seems like it should be cheaper because they're not reinventing the wheel with any new materials. They're not reinventing the wheel with any kind of new designs. They're just kind of um combining um uh, they're they're com they're using concepts and combining in materials that are readily available. So and they're using apparently less um, less components in this too. So obviously new tech. There's going to be a premium because they did some R and D and things like that. But yeah. Well, I mean, it'll be cheaper to produce a manufacture, but let's face it. You know what? We are living in a capitalistic society. Yeah. Look what happened with EpiPens and stuff that used to be nothing, and now they're thousands of dollars. And it's what, what? Um, because people they get a monopoly or patent and they can charge what they can charge. So, and people are always trying to make a buck. So, we'll have to see, right? If this is putting the uh, air conditioner business, uh, people out of business, or maybe it's not, maybe it's they're uh, a whole new profit center for them because they switch everything over exactly yeah 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 there's this thing and i didn't i i should have dove into it before this but um there's these new things that i'm seeing advertising called heat pumps that are supposed to replace the air conditioners right now um and heat i, I should been around for years yeah but i should have uh i haven't even looked at that technology and i should have for this but yeah yeah, they're. I mean, they're okay, they, but they're yeah. they're more energy efficient. They're not as good as air conditioners, yeah. um, but they will. They do both heating and air conditioning. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. All right. Any final words before we move on to the next thing? No, just this isn't microwave technology. It's just a, a type of way of cooling. Just so those, for those that uh, that are worried. And by the way. For microwaves, for those that don't know, those black dots on the door of your microwave, they're there to keep the microwaves inside and so that your face doesn't fry when you're looking at your food cooking, by the way, for those little fun, useless fact Thursday. Fun, useless fact? Yeah. Well, All actually, right. no, no. <laughs> Very relevant fact because, yeah. Anyways, continue. So let's talk about this next one. Time travel equation cracked. Yeah. Oh, cracked and in, in quotes. Um, so this is a it's a cool story. So Professor Millette, Ron Millette, he's an astrophysicist who has dedicated his career to researching time travel. Um, and the thing is, is his journey began tragically when his father died suddenly of a heart attack when when he was 10 years old. So he was so devastated, but he found solace in H.G. Wells's The Time Machine, which ignited a lifelong quest to build a real time machine. And he's been determined to understand the nature of time, and he's been motivated by the possibility of going back to see his father again, which it's sad but interesting. And through decades of study of Einstein's, Einstein's theories of relativity and the properties of black holes, he's developed his theoretical basis for time travel. What he proposes is that, and this is cool. I, I'll get in, this is cool because of Interstellar. And Interstellar got so many things so accurately correct when it comes to black holes and, and different things like that. So, but his proposal is that the immense gravity of rotating black hole can warp space time and create a time loop, twisting time back on itself. So he envisions replicating these effects using a circulating beam of laser light to manipulate gravity. And so by mimicking a spinning black hole, he, theori he theorizes 
that a time loop could be generated, allowing travel into the past. Now, the obstacles to actualizing such a time machine are monumental. And he admits that the energy requirements far exceed current capabilities. So the feasibility and scale of the device remain highly speculative, obviously. But he's optimistically claiming to have worked out the theory. The practical realization is, is like the theory's there, but the realization is, and you're, this is go back because we always ask how long we're talking decades or centuries away. Um, the other thing is his concept has limitations. Any time travel, and this relates to other time travel movies as well that, that you may or may not have seen, but any time travel would be constrained to the period after the machine is switched on. So you cannot go back to a point before the device was created. Um, so traveling back further in time remains firmly in the realm of science fiction. And I think there's, uh, I think it's the machine, uh, the TV show called The Lazarus Project, which um utilizes this concept but yeah really really interesting stuff really cool sci-fi kind of stuff that is not reality but but that one step closer yeah so there's a lot to talk about and unpack here i was quiet because you know i don't like the movie interstellar maybe i'm the only one but uh so every time you refer to it, I roll my eyes because, you know, it's a movie. Let's just not talk about it as scientific fact. But hey, yeah. Um, furthermore, he talks about you can send information back, but you can only send it back to the point, like you said, where you started the operating of the device. So um, since I just said, hey, that's a movie, let's not talk about it. Let me give you another movie. <laughs> what was the... Uh, Denzel Washington one where they sent him back like five days, seven days oh, to solve yeah, the there was like that boat attack. crash and everything. Yeah. I can't remember. Because they could just send him back. It was a very short period of time. It was um Yes. That was different because I think as as time progressed, the 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 um, like you could you could only go back a, a fixed amount of time. So as time went forward, you could only go back. A certain amount of time from that forward time if that makes sense was that right am i right in that um was that how it was or was it yes a fixed point regardless well i think it was a fixed window whatever they had a machine fixed it was window. a fixed yeah. window in an area of a, it can only go back seven days and was always shifting or what how many ever days it was yeah um similar to whatever that time travel machine they built in that i think there was a show called seven days where the guy could go back seven days Oh, I never saw that one. It, it was yeah. in a thing. And it would the interesting part of that was that he would like one save the world every time, pretty much. And yeah. um everything uh, he would lose all the the stuff that happened in the relationship for the past seven days because he'd go back. So he'd build yeah. up all this stuff with these characters, and then he'd go back and they would have either no idea who he was, or it, it, so there was a lot of interesting stuff where you know, after a few seasons, this person had a bunch of relationships with all these people around them that they had no recollection of because they were yeah. in other time jumps and stuff. So it becomes a little bit of a anyway. Let's get back to this rather than. Uh... No, no, but that's that's good. One more that just quickly. Um, the other one that comes to mind is I think it's the Edge of Tomorrow with Tom Cruise, where he dies and he keeps coming back. There's tons. I, I, we could do a whole episode on 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 those. But yeah, yeah. So. Let's get back to the theory here. So let me, you know, you put it in great scientific terms and me being the the normie in the room, if we're going to, from a point of view. So we shoot a bunch of lasers at a black hole and eventually we can cause it to spin? Yeah. Um, I, I did do a deep dive into it, but yeah, so... Um, Cause that doesn't seem like that would work at all to me. <laughs> no, I think it's, that's just for the, uh, to test some of his, um, uh, some of his formulas. I think that, I don't think that's what's going to make or break. And, and we might be able to, to get more into details of that in the next article that we talk about, but um, yeah. So his, the, the ideas it's, 
his ideas are are built again on on Einstein's general theory of relativity, and it shows that mass and energy can bend space time. So what he's done is he's tried to study the effects of rotating black holes on space time geometry using lasers. Um, but yeah, I don't know exactly what the experiments are that he's going to design. So there's black holes out there already rotating. What's causes a black hole to rotate versus not rotate? That's a good question. I does anyone out there know that? <laughs> That's Thanks a good watching, one. Everybody. No, I have no clue. What's that? Yeah. I, I like because we're talking specifically. So if we're not making them rotate with lasers, we're again, we're gonna in the next article, we're gonna talk about creating black holes and stuff. So we'll uh but I, I'm just trying to get my head around. Okay, so we have a we make or we have a black hole spinning we can only go back in time to the point we turned on this machine which i don't quite understand if the black hole has been spinning for a thousand uh, years already why couldn't we go back to the time of that so it's only when we turn on this machine at that point yeah. uh forward we can go back to that time so so speaking of people using uh gpt i just typed it in as you were talking here so uh what causes a black hole to rotate? There's a couple things. So angular momentum of the original star. So if the star that collapsed to form the black hole already had significant angular momentum, the rotation gets conserved and carried over to the black hole. Um, as the black hole, the other thing is disk spin. So as the black hole draws in and uh, it, it draws in the the surrounding material from the disk, the disk's orbital angular momentum gets transferred to spin up the black hole. Uh, the other one is mergers with other black holes, uh, outside torques. So interactions with external magnetic fields or gravitational forces can apply torques to spin up the black hole gradually over time. This is crazy stuff that I, I didn't do a deep dive into black holes before this, but now I'm going to after just doing this. So um, the other thing is in, in uh, we'll get into the next, I think it's in this one, but Hawking radiation. So some theories suggest- That's in the next one. Yeah, preferential yeah, emission of Hawking radiation in one direction could exert uh, torques to slowly spin up black holes. So this is interesting. And the article talks about a massive amount of energy needed to do this. So the question becomes, you know, we can generate massive amounts of energies from black holes. So, you know, setting up something that rotates a black hole to capture that energy and then using that to set up some sort of time travel portal thingy um seems you're logical. getting really into into sci-fi but the problem is though right I, and this is what i'm worried about is um uh if we actually cr like creating a black hole for us to harvest energy from uh the, that's just a bad idea are like, we are creating we black holes are a bad idea but, pardon are we going to be able to control it or is it going to consume us? Yeah. I mean, this is my, at this point in time, I'm thinking we have to, we're talking about these black holes out there that exist. We'd have to go to that black hole and, you know, or close enough to it that we could harvest stuff from it rather than. Yeah. But um, if we get close to that black hole, then that's when time is supposed to start warping. As well, well, close right? is relevant, right? Like it's, yeah. it's all. Yeah. Uh, right. So anyway, I, this is interesting obviously we've always thought black holes were connected uh to time and space it's interesting that the theoretically we can only go back to the time we we turned on this theoretical device that we're going to create yeah which um is a window rather than saying going back to um historical times and the second thing is they talk about sending data back, which to me is more realistic than other things. Yeah. And yeah. so how does that, in your mind, change the game? Let's just say in 20 years, one government turns on this thing and figures out how to uh, send data back. Yeah. Then we just get to... into the time loop and we get into... Absolutely. We get into all of these other things like uh, parallel parallel timelines uh um, doesn't that like that doesn't that end it for everyone like one, as soon as one person has it uh, or, or, yeah. or country or whatnot 
then immediately they're going to be get whatever technology from the future, right? Yeah, you, we're gonna have ten a lot minutes more later. Those... All this information will be dumped. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and then we'll have a lot more different monopoly uh, uh, arguments and Berenstein Bears arguments and different things like that with multiple different timelines. And it's scary. Uh, the pro the the thing that scares me the most is that the theories that are being um, are are being presented in the movies. If they're actually real, then we should definitely be worried about this for sure. But the thing is, is we don't know. And we're we're decades, if not centuries off from, from this being coming a reality. Unless, again, we talk about, unless there's a huge breakthrough, right? Unless we get the, uh, um, what's the device that uh, Tony Stark makes, that energy thing, the energy core or... or... Oh, yeah, the thing he's yeah. got. Um, I, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but yes yeah um, the so now you brought that out of the show okay what what are some of the ways to prevent time travel from becoming a reality <laughs> government oversight you know that's just gonna make everybody laugh right they're not gonna stop it they're just gonna want it for themselves no no that's what i mean yeah um <laughs> There's no way to stop it. You can't stop progression. You can't stop any anything from happening. Um, you can try to suppress it. Uh, but there's no way to... I don't think there's any way to stop it. Do you... It, it, you asked the question. Do you have anything in mind on, on how to stop it? Well, right now, obviously, they can't... If you need that amount of energy, we're, we're nowhere near it, so we're okay. But the, the this has always been my theory. Like, time travel doesn't exist yet yeah because where the time you know where are the time travels and this has always been a thing like if it existed in the future and people could come back at some point we would know about it it like it's yeah. just starts things start showing up in pictures things start happening you know we're we're now cameras everywhere in a society so it's interesting that um but if the theory is that well you can't go back um until the point where you turn on the machine then somebody just hasn't turned on the machine yet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I do you ever do you ever think about doing that? Oh, let's set this point in time, and if I ever can ever time travel, then uh, come back to this point in time and prove it to me, kind of thing. You ever thought about that? No, but that's interesting. Um, yeah. You know, I I always thought about. <laughs> you never can tell if you've made the right decision. Well, sometimes you can, but. You never can tell about the road not traveled, whether it's traffic like last night was we got out from our event just after the Raptors game. And I said, all right, let's just let's not like you see the let's keep going and we'll uh, head out Blue Jays way versus heading out near the ACC yeah. where the stuff's happening or whatever it's called now. Scotia Scotia Bank Bank Center. Arena. Yeah. Um, the and that worked out great for us. But the question yeah. is, would it work out of good or bad if we went the other way? And that's just like any decision in life, whether you yeah. date someone, marry someone, take a job, don't take a job, you know, smile, frown, these things yeah. that could change your life. Um, the question becomes like, you know, at what point does that, as soon as it becomes massively available, the world, everything just unravels. So yeah. I, I don't, you know, think we're going to be able to get there, but who knows? So, it's funny though. It's funny you say that though, because it reminds me of this episode of Community where uh, they're all in the apartment and a pizza is getting delivered, and and the Jeff rolls the 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 ten sided or six sided dice, and uh, they're like, you know, you just created six potential timelines, right? Because every roll of the dice is, uh, yeah, could so. Um, it's just it's it's crazy to think and and then now we get into we're, we're talking now we're talking about string theory right and we're talking about uh, parallel universes and different things like that so um, not just the thing is with this is I don't just think there's there's time travel issues I think there's parallel universe parallel timeline issues as well that come into play with this yeah that whole becomes uh, are there parallel realities. Are there you you say that when you roll a six-sided dice, you just created, you know, so you roll 
no. you roll you play D D or whatever you roll percentile that you just created a hundred different futures so yeah. uh, there's a lot of theories around this the question a lot of people say yeah no that's not how it works people will say it works from there's significant moments in your life it's not whether um you know you put an extra pinch of salt on your thing today yeah but it's your encounters with the other things around you not the rolling of the dice itself but the interactions with the people and the things yeah because you still roll the dice in all those realities the numbers doesn't really matter it's what matters what reactions is to the people around you yeah exactly yeah and it's just getting back to this article and this might be controversial but i think something that's more practical than this um is wormholes so rather than warping space time directly uh maybe transversible wormholes could potentially connect different points in space and time as a shortcut yeah it's all leading to these gravitational waves being way more powerful yeah. than anything we think of right absolutely yeah so this is really interesting love time travel stuff uh, we can doctor who up in here all day long. Um, any final words on this? No, just uh, in, in the thing is, is uh, going through this article and reading about it um, and reading about Professor Mallette. The thing is, is if you think about every genius or every like person who's come up with these different theories, the time that they in the time that they were alive. Um, they've always been seen as crazy or quack or whatever. And then later on down the road, uh, years later, um, their theories are proven. And so they they kind of redeem themselves after death. So um, who knows if this is one of those. But yeah, don't don't discount uh, these theories just yet. So let's jump to this next one. And I called it uh, Black Holes Glow Now. Yes. Yeah. So now we're going to get into this. So um, this is out of uh, University of Amsterdam. Physicists there, they simulated a black hole in the lab. And this was to test Stephen Hawking's theory that black holes emit radiation known as, surprise, surprise, Hawking radiation. Um, so what they did was they created an analog of a black hole's event horizon, which is um, uh, the boundary beyond which events can't affect an observer. So when they did that, they surprisingly, their simulated black hole started glowing, which could be indicative of Hawking radiation. And just to get into a little bit, Hawking radiation, it's believed to occur when particle-antiparticle pairs are generated at the event horizon with one particle escaping. And the glow in this experiment only happened when part of the experiment simulated curved space-time due to gravity, which supports the quantum basis of Hawking's theory. Um, so just, I know it's a lot, but the breakthrough, what it does is it allows researchers to study uh, elusive black hole properties using lab simulations. Um, so it's it, they're able to kind of um, push their understanding and, and advance their knowledge. Okay, so we talked about black holes a minute ago, and so the first thing we learn about black holes is light doesn't escape black holes. So how do we detect this glowing radiation? So now, yeah, that's cool. So um, Hawking, that's a good question. How do we detect <laughs> Sorry. it? Um, I, I don't know how they detected it. I didn't see that in the article. Um, I should have done a deeper dive, but I'm not sure. No velocity. No I know it's a phenomenon. To escape, like, yeah, it's, sucked it's, in, not even traveling beyond light speed. So, which is great. Um, but how do you detect this glow? I guess because it's a simulation in the lab. Yeah. And we can get into that how they how they simulated that. So, um, so what they did um, was they they simulated a black hole in the lab by creating an analog that exhibited some of the key properties of an event horizon. So, creating an analog in relation to a black hole creation 
what it means by it, you're constructing a system that mimics some of the important properties of a black hole without actually creating a black hole. So just so you know, they haven't actually created a black hole. What they're doing is they're aiming to re reproduce some of the features of the black hole, like we just talked about, event horizon and Hawking radiation in a small experimental setup. It's done by manipulating exotic states of matter or engineered devices to imitate gravitational space-time warping. So, for example, using sound waves in a fluid to model an acoustic horizon or laser light, like we were talking about before, in optical fiber, which represents a photonic event horizon. So that's why I wasn't able to answer your question, because they're not actually creating a black hole, right? And so... Um, detecting it from a black hole kind of threw me because I, I I don't know how you would detect it regardless. So, but um, analog models, what they do is they allow phenomenon like black, like Hawking radiation to be studied in a controlled lab environment versus observing black holes. So the thing is, is it's only replicating limited aspects of a black hole's physics. But what it does is it provides insights on the underlying quantum processes. So we're getting into quantum again. All this stuff, Guys, most of the stuff that we talk about future tech that's really advanced, it all is derived or all comes back to quantum properties, quantum mechanics, quantum physics, things like that. So when we're talking about things like this, it does it does go beyond, you have to, again, and I, I repeat this every time quantum comes up, but you have to throw out all of your understanding of physics and, and things like that as you know it today. Um, so, yeah. So what it does so a black hole analog uses innovative techniques which we talked about to mimic black hole behavior in a small system it doesn't create a black hole it creates similar effects to the black hole if that makes sense similar properties yeah and it's suggesting that this may be due to some sort of quantum entanglement like you were mentioning so yeah. that um quantum entanglement may not be affected by radiation by radiation yeah. sorry by uh, gravity <laughs> well yeah and and that's if you think about the concept of quantum entanglement right quantum entanglement means that there's two particles that that exhibit the same properties at the same time right until you you observe it so that could make sense but again this we're talking like <laughs> super advanced uh, tech at this point yeah, so they're talking about, you know, what are some of the potential applications of simulating black holes in labs? And I always like to say that, you know, we talk about simulations and computer models and computer models are always, they're all wrong. Yeah. But some of them are valuable. So we just have to take a step back. Some people just say, oh, computer models. Well, that was just some guy programming a bunch of stuff into a spreadsheet and running a simulation. Yeah. So, you know, these are it's great that we can advance stuff but i'm not 100 percent sure that the results of everything will be real but what are some ten sub potential applications of this breakthrough yeah this is cool though because um obviously we talked about you could investigate the hawking radiation properties um so you could develop new detection methods which could help guide the development of instruments and techniques to detect the hawking radiation from actual black holes because there's no way to do it right now right um, so it could validate the existence, um, testing the quantum entanglement and information paradoxes. So black hole simulations may allow for testing quantum effects like entanglement across the event horizons, which could provide insights into information paradoxes. Um, so investigating other space-time geometries. So other exotic space-time ge geometries beyond black holes could be simulated and studied. Uh, developing materials with unique properties. So the extreme gravitational analog environment could potentially lead to these huge breakthroughs of development of materials with novel mechanical, optical, or quantum properties. That's the one that I'm most excited about because that one is the one that I see as the most practical for uh, for us right now, if that makes sense. Like black holes, to me, they're great they're really interesting. I'd love to be sucked into one. <laughs> um, but it's so hard to 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 um, to observe, to measure, to do a whole bunch of things with actual black holes. So by taking the theories of 
the lab stuff and be able, be able to use that to develop materials, new materials with, with new types of properties. That's really cool to me. So you talked about the black hole information paradox. What is that? So, um, the black hole, um, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> Just so uh, uh, while you're just me this morning after a late night too. So I know I, I hate to ask these tough questions. I keep it out. Yeah. Midnight. Well, it's a theoretical problem that's highlighting the apparent contradictions between quantum mechanics and relatively relativity around black holes. So uh, according to quantum mechanics, physical information about the state of a system should never be destroyed, but black holes are predicted to completely evaporate over time. And that's kind of getting into Hawking radiation. So it suggests that any matter or information swallowed by the black hole will be lost forever once the black hole fully evaporates. So the thing is, is this vol this violates quantum, uh, some sort of quantum thing, I can't remember. Um, on the other hand, general relativity says that information should, should always be conserved according to the laws of physics. So it contradicts conclusions from quantum theory. Um, so. The, it, it remains a question of what happens to information swallowed by black holes, right? So it remains a huge mystery of the fundamental of physics, essentially. So it's just another example of how physics is real physics and quantum physics is magic. <laughs> I knew you are getting there. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so they're simulating black holes. Are they actually trying to create a black hole? And should we be worried about that? They're going to destroy all of us because, oops, I just created a black hole and now we're all gone. Yeah. So I, I don't think there's a need to worry that black holes created in the lab could become dangerous or uncontrolled. And, and I'll explain for a few reasons. So first off, the, um, the thing, and we're going back to what I already explained, but the, the lab only mimics properties of black holes. So they don't contain anywhere near the mass or gravitational pull to actually become a black hole. At most, they recreate the space-time warping effect. So the other thing is they're using specialized metamaterials and nanostructures to create the analog effects, which I don't know any, any information about. But um, if these were disrupted, the black hole-like effects would immediately disappear. Um, the other thing, too, is the experiments operate at microscopic scales using photons, sound waves, or electrical currents. So... There's really, at, at that scale, there's no chance for an uncontrolled growth based on what they're doing right now. Um, the other thing, too, is the researchers have full access to tune and turn off the equipment generating the simulations. Um, and then there's lab safety standards. But you never know, right, uh, with lab safety standards. That one doesn't really put me at ease. But more of the that they're mimicking only some of the properties, that more puts me at ease. So, um the mimicking the reality, puts me at ease oh, rather than the that? other stuff. The mimicking puts me at ease. That other stuff doesn't because the other stuff nope. sounds like, you know, every classic uh, sci-fi horror story. Well, we put all the stuff in place. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, black holes power themselves. You don't, yeah. they don't need, once they start, you're, they don't need you or machine turned on to continue. <laughs> they just continue by sucking everything in and increasing their power by that. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. So yeah, the only thing that really puts me at ease is that they're only mimicking. Uh, everything else doesn't really put me at ease. But it, I guess, it's nice fluff. Yeah. So one last question before we talk, we see what's happening in everyone's lives here is, all right, um, is this going to lead to bigger advancements, advancements in quantum computing, and? Or is quantum computing going to be, is this what the $5 million answer that quantum computing can solve is time travel? It's a good question. Um, but um, because there's so much quantum physics uh, tied to black holes, that could potentially lead to advancements in quantum computing in a, quantum computing in a few ways. Um, so testing quantum gravity theories, uh, black hole simulations could serve as a platform for testing theories that aim to unify quantum mechanics and gravity, such as loop quantum gravity, um, which often make predictions relevant for quantum information science. And I didn't do a deep dive into um, kind of what 
the advancements actually mean. I just came to, kind of came, came up with a list of different things. So um, developing qubits. So some proposed qubits implementations, they rely on artificial analogs of event horizons to isolate quantum information. So the techniques in these simulations could inform uh, quantum computing platforms, which is really cool. Um, and then quantum advantages, exploring quantum advantages, which we talked about before. So simulating gravitational systems may offer us a route to explore quantum advantage on controllable analog quantum computers before fully scalable ones are built. So there's a lot of work that remains, but the field of artificial black hole simulation could provide a really great testing ground for developing ideas and technology relevant to quantum computers for sure. Yeah, and I want to get um, a couple of Canadian quantum computing yeah. founders in just to talk about some stuff, like I said. But that might take a month or two to coordinate everything. Any final words on this? I mean, I'm. this is really cool. I'm just curious as to where we're going. Yeah, no, no real thoughts. Um, these are, again, these are really... Uh, advanced concepts and uh, that's why I didn't have as many of the answers that I normally have because when we're talking this advanced kind of tech it's a lot to grasp uh, especially me just being a software engineer and not a quantum uh, physicist but um, I think there's some really cool technology again um, we're all most of this stuff is theoretical except for the reverse microwave um, but a lot of the stuff we talk about is theoretical guys. So there's, there's really not much that is proven yet. Uh, think about for those of you that, that think about uh, the big bang theory, uh, the work that Sheldon and Sheldon does, it's all theoretical work, right? So it's the stuff that we talk about is stuff like that. Thanks for all the information. Um, we know that you work with Tep companies to help them forget government funding and navigate the fun world of being a startup here in Canada. Um, yeah. Anything you want to add to that and where can people go find out more if they have questions about, you know, funding and want to talk to you? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, send me, send me a message on LinkedIn. Find me on LinkedIn. Very easy. John Irwin, no H. Um, and I'm happy to have a discussion. Um, happy Craig and I work, work very closely together. So um, if there's something that that I feel Craig might work better with you on, um, I'll I'll definitely pass them your way. But if you have any questions on non-dilutive government funding, hiring, uh, hiring grants, training grants, uh, shred any tax credits or or any kind of grants, feel free to reach out to me. And if any of you listening, you know the audio or video is breaking up. We do separate local recordings. It takes a while to come out, but the audio will be pushed out on the podcast. Um, we push it out. We're about a, two weeks behind our, the, when the podcasts come out, we're just from the timeline point of view, but we'll get great audio and stuff there. Um, sure. check out all of our stuff. We help entrepreneurs. We do events. Uh, we talked about, we were just talking about last night. We we're at startup drinks. To we are CIX after party. We had a hundred people out. There is about 20 investors in the room. Um, it was a great time. People, it's open pitch, open bar. Check out startupdrinksto.com. The next one will be April 25th, and that'll be posted by the time you're seeing this. I work with startups all the time. If you're stuck in your business and you don't know where to go and you want to move forward and you're frustrated, book a discovery call. Go to startupcoach.ca. It's absolutely free. We can chat about how I can help you and how to get unstuck and actually turn your business into a profitable, successful, and a happy place for you to work. Check out all our stuff at torontostarts.com. Um, thanks for watching us today. Any last words, John? No, just uh, thanks for everyone for listening and uh, look out for future episodes for sure. And enjoy the weekend, everyone. Thanks for watching. Thanks.